it's a privilege to be able to contribute to the work of this extremely important school, which has already covered a vast wealth of historical and theoretical material, uh, which truly gives expression, I think, to, to the continuity of uh, the world Trotskyist movement. And uh, it would be entirely possible to devote an entire week or longer to discussing the period from 1982 to 1986, which uh, may well be the most well-documented split uh, in the history of uh, socialism. Um, just to repeat what other comrades have said, we are presenting here, uh, what we're presenting here is, is an introduction and a guide to further study. Now, the previous lecture by Comrade Christoph uh, examined uh, the beginnings of the theoretical and political struggle uh, against the opportunist degeneration of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. This was launched by, in David North's 1982 critique of Jerry Healy's travesty of Marxism in his studies in dialectical materialism as well as the series of articles, uh, Leon Trotsky and the Development of Marxism. The political summary at the end of Comrade North's uh, critique states that, that, quote, the vulgarization of Marxism palmed off as the struggle for dialectics has been accompanied by an unmistakable opportunist drift within the International Committee and especially in the WRP, end quote. Jerry Healy's idealist practice of cognition served to suppress discussion of political problems and differences within the party and to justify the crassest opportunist practices. The study of Trotsky's writings, as has already been said, was abandoned uh, along with the political and theoretical fight against Pabloite revisionism. For all intents and purposes, Comrade North wrote, the theory of permanent revolution has been treated as inapplicable to present circumstances. This theory remains the fundamental programmatic foundation of Trotskyism as the revolutionary Marxism of our time. It can be traced to the call made by Marx and Engels, um, drawing the lessons of the 1848 revolutions um, following which Marx insisted that there could be no political unity between the democratic petty bourgeoisie and the working class. Marx wrote that, quote, while the democratic petty bourgeois wished to bring the revolution to a conclusion as quickly as possible, it is our interest and our task to make the revolution permanent until all more or less possessing classes have been forced out of their position of dominance, the proletariat has conquered state power, and the association of proletarians, not only in one country, but in all the dominant countries of the world, has advanced so far that competition among the proletarians in these countries has ceased and that at least the decisive productive forces are concentrated in the hands of the proletarians." End quote. This basic conception was developed and enriched by Trotsky, drawing upon the lessons of the 1905 revolution. In opposition to the Mensheviks, who insisted on the subordination of the working class to bourgeois liberalism, Trotsky explained the organic incapacity of the bourgeoisie to achieve the democratic revolution. The tasks of the revolution could only be fulfilled by the working class coming to power through its own revolutionary party and leading the peasantry and all the oppressed masses. This was conceived not as a national revolution, but as the opening of the world revolution. This perspective was substantiated in practice by the 1917 October Revolution. Lenin arrived at the same conclusions as Trotsky. He abandoned the old formula of the Bolsheviks of a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, and in April carried out a fundamental reorientation of the party towards the seizure of power, in opposition to Stalin and leading members of the Bolshevik party, who were moving towards regroupment with the Mensheviks and support for, a provisional gov for the 
bourgeois government. In 1933, Trotsky summed up the enduring significance of the theory of permanent revolution in the rearming of the proletariat following the disastrous defeats, uh, including in China, uh, brought about by the Stalinist bureaucracy's adoption of the two-stage theory. The theory of re permanent revolution, he said, was underpinned by three basic concepts. Quote, Firstly, the national bourgeoisie, which during the initial stages seeks to utilize the revolution for itself, invariably goes over to the other side of the barricades, to the feudal classes and the imperialist oppressors in the course of the further development of the revolution. Secondly, the petty bourgeoisie, or peasantry, can no longer play a leading role in the bourgeois revolution and consequently cannot take power. Hence flows the rejection of the bourgeois democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. And thirdly, under the dictatorship of the proletariat, the bourgeois democratic revolution passes over into the socialist revolution, which can only triumph completely as a link in the world revolution. The WRP would ultimately betray all of these principles. Beginning in the late 1970s, it established opportunist alliances and relations with bourgeois nationalist organizations and regimes. This included uncritical support for the Palestinian Liberation Organization, for the National Liberation Movement in Zimbabwe, for Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq, and the Khomeini regime that came to power in Iran. A financial relationship was established with Gaddafi's regime in Libya, which the leaders of the WRP concealed from the party and from the International Committee. The perspective of building Trotskyist parties in these countries was abandoned. Instead, the WRP promoted bourgeois nationalist leaders as the legitimate leadership of the working class and, and the entire population. This was accompanied by an increasingly uncritical promotion within Britain of sections of the labor and union bureaucracy. This lecture will examine how, following David North's October 1982 critique, the Workers' League undertook a principled struggle to defend the theory of permanent revolution against the opportunist degeneration uh, of the WRP. The record completely disproves the false and self-serving position advanced by Cliff Slaughter that there had been an equal degeneration across all sections of the ICFI because no one was able to challenge Healy's domination and his bullying. Slaughter wrote to David North in November 1985, quote, all the leaders of the IC were part of Healyism as well as its victims, and that must be confronted analyzed and corrected." End quote. In this way, Slaughter sought to absolve himself of any responsibility for the crisis in the WRP and to discredit the ICFI as the embodiment of the continuity of the Trotskyist movement. These were his first steps towards open renunciation of the ICFI and of Trotskyism. The degeneration of the WRP did not happen overnight. The SLL had led the fight against the reunification of the Socialist Workers' Party with the Pabloite International Secretariat in 1963, and Healy and Slaughter had exposed the embrace of Castroism by the SWP and the great betrayal carried out by the LSSP in Sri Lanka, um, which have already been discussed in, in this school. But 10 years later, the British section was in retreat, adapting to powerful nationalist pressures in Britain, including widespread illusions in the Labour Party and the union bureaucracy. The radicalization of broad layers of the working class and the middle class in response to the revolutionary upheavals of the late 1960s led to an influx of members but these members were not trained as internationalists and Trotskyists. The WRP leadership 
gradually came to see the fight for political clarification and training as an impediment to the growth of its resources and its membership. In the years following the SWP's reunification with the Pabloites, which resulted in the relative isolation of the British section, Healy increasingly came to view the growth of the Trotskyist movement uh, as the byproduct of a growing of growing a powerful national section in Britain. Ultimately, as David North explains in his biography, Jerry Healy and his place in the history of the Fourth International, the shift to reliance on middle class layers in the UK and opportunist financial relationships with bourgeois regimes in the Middle East both reflected, quote, a, polit a lack of political confidence in the possibility of winning the working class to the program of Marxism, a rejection of the revolutionary role of the working class as the grave digger of capitalism and the builder of a new socialist society, end quote. The historical development of the Workers' League, as well as the Revolutionary Communist League in Sri Lanka, was very different. Both those organizations had been founded as a result of struggle against Pabloism. The Workers' League's founding cadre were expelled from the SWP in 1964 for defending a political dis for, for demanding a political discussion on the entry of the LSSP into the Bandaranaike government in Sri Lanka. The first time in history that a party claiming allegiance to the Fourth International had entered a bourgeois coalition. This historic betrayal, uh, as has already been discussed, demonstrated the role of Pabloite revisionism as a vital support for the bourgeois and imperialist world order. The RCL, founded in 1968 in opposition to the LSSP's betrayal, soon came into conflict with the backsliding of the British section. Its secretary, Kirti Balasuriya, sharply opposed a statement issued by the SLL in December 1971 in the name of the ICFI that gave critical support to the deployment of Indian troops to East Pakistan, ostensibly in, or in order to support a national liberation struggle in what was to become Bangladesh. Comrade Kirti wrote, quote, the logic of the false political position of the IC on Bangladesh would have and has led to the abandonment of all the past experiences of the Marxist movement regarding the struggles of the colonial masses, end quote. The RCL had insisted that the Indian military intervention was undertaken precisely to suppress a revolutionary struggle to unify East and West Bengal. It warned in a statement that none of the bourgeois governments in the region could be relied upon by the working class. The Socialist Labour League in Britain ensured, however, that the RCL's criticisms remained unknown within the ICFI and worked to isolate the Sri Lankan section. The British section also created enormous difficulties for the RCL in its fight to unify Sinhala and Tamil workers on the basis of a socialist program that included the recognition of the right to the self-determination of the Tamil people. Mike Bander initially opposed self-determination for the Tamils, thereby supporting the state established by imperialism in, in 1948, based on Sinhala chauvinism. In 1979, however, the WRP switched its position to one of uncritical support for the LTTE, essentially promoting this organization as the legitimate leadership of the Tamil people and denigrating the fight by the RCL to establish Trotskyist leadership in the working class. Uh, and some of these points, uh, the other Tom will, will expand on uh, in greater detail. Previous lectures have, have already examined the significance of the renegacy of Tim Walforth and the security and the fourth international investigation, which were crucial developments in the political struggle against Pabloite liquidationism in the United States. This fight was continually deepened by the Workers' League and was central to the recruitment and training of its cadre during the 1970s and 1980s. 
at the same time as the Workers' League was coming into direct conflict with the WRP opportunists, it was intensifying its exposure of the SWP's revisionism in the United States. Comrades understood that these two struggles were profoundly interconnected. On December 31st, 1982, Socialist Workers' Party National Secretary Jack Barnes gave a speech to the Young Socialists National Convention in which he explicitly repudiated the entire heritage of the Trotskyist movement. The speech uh, was not immediately published, but the Workers' League was able to obtain a partial transcript and prepared a politically devastating response published uh, in August 1983 as a pamphlet titled A Provocateur Attacks Trotskyism. It is clear reading this pamphlet, although it's not explicitly stated, that it that the document is also aimed against the positions which had been embraced by the Workers' Revolutionary Party. The Workers' League statement defends the theory of permanent revolution as the programmatic essence of Trotskyism as the Marxism of our time, which interpreted the October Revolution as, quote, a turning point in world history, i.e. the beginning on a world historical scale of the transition from capitalism to socialism and which revealed the interconnection between this world historical development and the class struggle in every country, end quote. The Workers' League statement laid bare the extreme degeneration of the SWP to the point where, as it said, nothing remained of the party founded in 1938 other than the name. Barnes's speech advanced a particularly vulgar form of Pabloism. He denounced the theory of permanent revolution as a deviation from Marxism and Leninism, which led to the Fourth International being, quote, shoved off the axis of the Comintern. According to Barnes, the theory of permanent revolution, quote, broke the post-Russian revolutionary unity between Lenin and Trotsky in the political sense. It opened the door to sectarian, ultra-left interpretations and utilizations of the theory of permanent revolution. He stated, quote, permanent revolution is not a correct generalization or an adequate one, or one that doesn't open up more problems than it solves as to what our program is. We will get much, much more by reducing the permanent revolution by pointing out, in my opinion, that it is not useful as a general term for our program." End quote. Summing up the perspective of the SWP leadership, Barnes declared, quote, Trotskyism, that term itself, I predict none of us will call ourselves before the, this decade's out. Now Barnes's argument, as the Workers' League explained, is not only with Trotskyism, it is with history itself. Barnes asserted that Trotsky had misrepresented Lenin by claiming that the latter had abandoned the theory of the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry upon his return to Russia in 1917, and that he had adopted the theory of permanent revolution in his April theses. Um, according to Barnes, this was false. This is precisely the big lie that Stalin advanced in 1924 in his campaign against Trotsky and the left opposition, which began as an attack on the theory of permanent revolution and accusations that Trotsky had underestimated the peasantry. This went hand in hand with the bureaucracy's rejection of internationalism in favor of the theory of socialism in, one in a single country. In fact, Lenin had repeatedly stated from April 1917 that the old formula was uh, obsolete, uh, it was no good at all, it is dead, and it's no use trying to revive it. He identified the same problem that Trotsky had stressed, that the formula of the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry did not solve the problem of which class would rule. This limitation was confirmed in the February Revolution, the Soviet embodied a dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry, which had ceded power to the bourgeoisie. And the April theses uh, explicitly rejected 
the, the two-stage theory of revolution of advanced by the Mensheviks and called for an uninterrupted or permanent revolution. In Lenin's words, quote, the specific feature of the present situation in Russia is that the country is passing from the first stage of the revolution, which owing to the insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat, placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie, to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest sections of the peasants. The Socialist Workers' Party revived the old Stalinist lies to justify its complete abandonment of any perspective for building independent revolutionary parties based on the working class. As the Workers' League explained, quote, Stalinists, centrists, and all petty bourgeois radicals who hate the working class have always had a problem with the permanent revolution because it is the theoretical guide for the struggle against every form of class collaboration and subordination of the working class to the political agencies of the bourgeoisie." End quote. Comrade North again stressed the Stalinist character of Barnes's positions in his report to the International Committee in February 1984. Barnes, he said, was calling for a quote, workers and farmers government, i.e. not for a dictatorship of the proletariat. And the Stalinists themselves uh, who he was echoing were very explicit about this. Comrade North quoted from a leading Soviet theorist on national liberation, uh, Rostislav Ulyanovsky, who had written that the task in developing countries was to take, quote, steps towards socialism by placing, quote, mass pressure on bourgeois democracy, thus helping it to realize its progressive potentialities. Uh, this theorist also said, it is necessary to bear in mind that the promotion of the slogan calling for the adoption of, an, of the non-capitalist path by no means implies that it also calls for a socialist revolution, the establishment of a people's democracy and the assumption of power by the communists." End quote. The orientation of the SWP was uh, specifically towards the petty bourgeois nationalist regimes uh, that had emerged in Central and, and South America. In March 1982, uh, Barnes had declared, quote, we consider ourselves part of a common world Marxist movement with the FL FSLN of Nicaragua, the New Dual Movement of Grenada, with the Cuban Communist Party, with the vanguard proletarian leaderships of the revolutionary struggles in El Salvador and Guatemala, he went on, we think that's how the entire Fourth International should view itself. We are part of a common Marxist movement with these revolutionists. We are not part of a common movement with a lot of people and organizations that call themselves Trotskyists, end quote. Obviously, that's a reference to the ICFI. The Workers' League statement responding to Barnes reviews in detail how the SWP, with Joseph Hansen playing a leading role, seized upon the Cuban Revolution uh, as proof that there was no longer any need for Trotskyist leadership to be built in the working class. These revol the revolutionary tasks could be entrusted to, quote, unconscious Marxists such as Fidel Castro. This turn by the SWP and the move towards reunification with the Pabloites was accompanied by the influx of state agents into the party via the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Barnes was one of 12 agents recruited from the conservative Carleton College who were quickly elevated into leading positions by Joseph Hansen. This group then played a major role in preparing uh, the ground for the expulsion of Walforth and other supporters of the ICFI. The purge continued and accelerated in line with the political degeneration of the SWP, with dozens of founding members expelled from the party during the early 1980s. And, and this is reviewed in, in the, the pamphlet. The statement of the Workers' League makes the important point that, quote, 
the degeneration of the Socialist Workers' Party is not simply the product of Hansen's activities as a government spy. However, under conditions of deepening political crisis within the SWP during the 1950s, with the theoretical issues arising from the 1953 split still unresolved, with leaders such as Cannon far past their physical and political prime, and with factional infighting rampant among the top leaders, the work of Hansen assumed enormously destructive proportions." End quote. It goes on to explain that this degeneration was not inevitable. Quote, In the late 1950s, the collaboration of the Socialist Labour League with the American Trotskyists could have provided great assistance in overcoming the internal crisis within the SWP. Together with the changes in the political situation in the United States, especially the growth of the mass movement among black workers for civil rights, the SWP could have once again made great strides forward as a Trotskyist movement." End quote. Instead, Hansen and his protégés worked to poison the atmosphere within the SWP against the SLL by spreading lies that, that Jerry Healy opposed the Cuban Revolution. The SLL had always taken a principled stand in defense of the Cuban Revolution against US imperialism. This did not, however, justify the embrace of its nationalist leadership as a substitute for the building of the Trotskyist movement in Cuba. It must be emphasized that the SWP's complete rejection of the struggle for political independence of the working class also, of course, applied to the United States, where its orientation was towards left-wing Democrats such as Jesse Jackson, based on black nationalism and identity politics. Barnes claims that Jackson was, quote, opening up the same starting point that the major figures in the labor movement and in the organizations of the oppressed nationalities who are involved in this claim to take. Namely, he was opening up uh, the alliance of labor, blacks and Latinos, the working class and the oppressed nationalities, however it gets formulated. It is, of course, completely false to describe Blacks and Latinos as a, an oppressed nation separate from the working class. This served to cover up the class differentiations which exist among these uh, minorities. With such statements, the Workers' League explained, the SWP was, quote, pandering to the petty bourgeois elements among the Blacks and Hispanics and cynically working with them in order to build a bridge to the Democratic Party. The Workers' League hopes that uh, exposing the SWP's attack on Trotskyism and reminding the SLL of its role in the historic fight against reunification would assist in clarifying the political problems in the WRP and correcting the, and reorienting the party. Comrade North was encouraged by the fact that when Jerry Healy was told about Barnes's December 1982 speech, he enthusiastically supported the proposal for the Workers' League to respond and expose his positions. On February 11, 1984, David North again reminded the WRP leaders of the role that they had played in the early 1960s in the fight against the SWP's attempt to revise Trotskyism on the basis of the defeats inflicted on imperialism by the Cuban Revolution. The SLL had warned in its very first letter to the SWP that, quote, the greatest danger confronting the revolutionary movement is liquidationism. And that, quote, any retreat from the strategy of political independence of the working class and the construction of revolutionary parties will take on the significance of a world historical blunder on the part of the Trotskyist movement. North's report to the IC in, in 1984 explained the similarity between the SWP's open repudiation of permanent revolution and the positions adopted by the WRP. The relations which existed between the WRP and, and various bourgeois leaders throughout the Middle East, uh, which Tom Scripps will elaborate on, 
were strikingly similar to the orientation of the SWP to, to those regimes in Latin America. North's report explained that, quote, the latest attack by Barnes on Trotskyism must bring this entire history forward precisely because the International Committee has always recognized that such crucial developments within the ranks of the revisionists inevitably foreshadow great new chapters in the World Socialist Revolution. Moreover, we don't simply look upon revolution as some sort of bacteria that exists in a, inside a test tube safely stored in a laboratory. Precisely because revisionism has material roots in the actual development of the class struggle of which we ourselves are a part because it reflects the pressure of alien class forces upon the working class and its revolutionary vanguard, our response to revisionism finds its highest expression in the analysis of our own political development. The WRP, however, had no interest in making any objective analysis of its own political development, and it repeatedly sought to block such a discussion within the IC by attacking the Workers' League, suppressing its criticisms, and threatening a split. The political conflict between the WRP and the Workers' League deepened in the course of 1983, and it flared up on the issue of the US invasion of Grenada. At a meeting of the IC in October 1983, Mike Bander sharply attacked the response of the bulletin, including a front page article with the headline, Reagan is a liar, which Bander said uh, was a propagandist response to the invasion. In a subsequent letter to Comrade North in December 1983, Cliff Slaughter deepened the attack and criticized the Workers' League, making the infamous statement that, that uh, has already been quoted, quote, your own heavy emphasis on the political independence of the working class, backed by a quotation from In Defense of Marxism, will become a weapon in the hands of all those who retain the mark of pragmatism, because it will be treasured by them as something more concrete than the explicit struggle to develop and comprehend the categories of dialectics as the method for that life and death matter of grasping the rapid and all-sided developments thrown up by the world crisis." End quote. As uh, Comrade Christoph has already noted, here we see slaughter counterposing Marxist method to the fight for the political independence of the working class. Rather than Marxist method, being the tool to establish the political independence of the working class. Uh, I'll say a, more about this passage uh, and Comrade North's reply to it shortly. But Slaughter was objecting to the Workers' League's political committee statement, mobilize labor against US imperialism. This statement published on October 28th explained that the invasion of Grenada was part of a resurgence of US military violence, including the dispatch of Marines to Lebanon and the funding of Contras to fight against the Nicaraguan government. Driven by its economic crisis, the imperialist powers were being uh, driven towards the violent redivision of the world. The, the British war in the Malvinas, the Falkland Islands, and the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, both of which were supported by the United States were part of the, quote, drive to recolonize re the vast territories in which at least formal national independence was gained in the period since the Second World War. The invasion of Grenada also served domestic purposes. It was accompanied by hysterical denunciations of communism by Ronald Reagan, whose administration was simultaneously engaged in the ruthless suppression of the class struggle. Reagan claimed that the tiny island of Grenada had somehow been turned into a Soviet and Cuban military satellite that would pose a threat to democracy. The immediate trigger for the invasion was the bloody coup within the New Jewel movement, a radical nationalist party which had come to power in a revolution in, in 1979. The Reagan administration cynically declared that it had to intervene 
uh, to protect a group of American medical students uh, and other Americans in Grenada who were in fact never at any risk of harm. The New Dual Movement, um, despite being hailed by the SWP as conscious Marxists uh, who had established what the SWP called a workers and farmers government, was in fact a bourgeois nationalist regime which had carried out limited reforms uh, seeking to develop the country's economy and to establish greater independence from the imperialist powers. On October 19th, 1983, Grenada's Prime Minister, the leader of the New Dual Movement, Maurice Bishop, was murdered along with several other of his ministers and trade union leaders by a rival faction of the NJM led by his former deputy, Prime Minister Bernard Coard, and backed by the army. These events were the bloody culmination of a power struggle bound up with conflicts over economic and foreign policy. Morris Bishop had recently traveled to the United States and was in fact appealing for the normalization of diplomatic relations with the Reagan administration. Uh, apparently this was opposed by, by his rivals uh, who were more oriented towards stronger ties with Cuba and the Soviet Union. The Workers' League explained that, quote, the bloody events in Grenada demonstrate once again the organic instability and political insolvency of such nationalist tendencies drawn from the petty bourgeois intelligentsia in the former colonial and neo-colonial countries, end quote. As Trotsky had explained, such elements were incapable of leading the democratic revolution to victory because it required the dictatorship of the proletariat, including the creation of real organs of workers' power. The Workers' League explained, quote, lacking any Marxist perspective without any scientific comprehension of the relationship between party and class, buffeted by class forces which they hope to manipulate without understanding the logic of the historical process, and simultaneously disoriented and corrupted by the Soviet Stalinist bureaucracy, these petty bourgeois leaders settle accounts violently and behind the backs of the masses they claim to represent. In its statement immediately after the invasion, the one that Cliff Slaughter objected to, the Workers' League denounced the tacit support for US imperialism from the AFL-CIO and, uh, and, and from the Democratic Party, and the perfidious role of the Soviet government, which appeared to have encouraged the coup in Grenada, providing the pretext for the invasion. Stressing the connection between the eruption of US militarism and the bipartisan assault on the American working class, the statement declared that the invasion could only be defeated by mobilizing the strength of the working class. It said, quote, the central issue facing the American working class is the necessity to establish its political independence through the formation of a Labour Party and the struggle for a workers' government committed to abolishing the capitalist system and establishing socialism, end quote. Slaughter opposed this statement. He wrote that, quote, the central issue is to fight for the defeat of, US imperial, of the US imperialist invasion in Grenada and its coming attack in Nicaragua. And he called on the Workers' League to issue a clear statement, quote, that a defeat for US imperialist forces in Grenada would be a victory for the American working class and workers everywhere, making it clear that we are for unconditional support, even of the military clique in power in Grenada." End quote. It should, it should be noted that Grenada is one of the smallest countries in the world, uh, and in 1983 it had a population of just uh, about 100,000 people, and barely any armed forces to speak of. Uh, certainly nothing capable of repelling the American invasion force, which easily overran the island. The implication by Cliff Slaughter that the Grenadian people could have been victorious on the battlefield somehow was utterly absurd. Clearly, the defeat of American imperialism was only possible through the mobilization of the American working class against the invasion, 
which did in fact trigger mass protests and mass opposition uh, throughout North America and internationally. According to Slaughter, the Workers' League's declaration that, quote, the main target of, of the Reagan administration's attacks was the American working class. Um, according to Slaughter, this showed, quote, a tinge of reservation about the anti-imperialist content of the colonial revolution, a tinge of reservation about the unity of the proletarian revolution in the advanced capitalist countries and the colonial national liberation movements, end quote. In his response to these provocative accusations, uh, Comrade North rejected the claim that the Workers' League had drifted away from a position of revolutionary defeatism. He reviewed the record of the bulletin in the two months leading up to the invasion, which continually opposed US intervention in Lebanon and Nicaragua and the imperialist conspiracies against the PLO. In every case, the Workers' League had, quote, continuously raised the issue of mobilizing the working class in the United States against imperialism and in support of the semi-colonial countries, end quote. Comrade North then explained that beyond Slaughter's immediate objection to the bulletin's position on Grenada, Slaughter's letter pointed to a more fundamental difference between the perspective of the WRP and that of the Workers' League. Quote, uh, sorry, in response to Slaughter's denigration of the call for the political independence of the working class, North wrote, uh, I'm astonished by this argument, which goes against everything that we have been taught by the International Committee and by you personally. He said Slaughter's approach, which explicitly separates the fight for the defeat of the US invasion of Grenada from the struggle to establish the political independence of the working class, is identical to that of every revisionist and Stalinist group in the United States. And North posed the question, wasn't it against this invidious distinction that the Workers' League and the IC based their struggle against the opportunist Pabloite conception of the anti-war movement? North noted that although Slaughter had criticized the Workers' League for taking a pragmatic approach and for abandoning dialectics, this was in fact the method of, that Slaughter was using in counterposing the so-called real developments in Grenada and Lebanon to the, quote, abstract matters of program and principle. North explained, quote, what must be studied and developed is the correct application of the dialectical method and historical materialism. However, this is by no means undermined by by heavy emphasis on the political independence of the working class. I believe that a serious study of all of Lenin's works, and most explicitly, his earliest economic and philosophical studies, will reveal the inner connection between his concentration on the, on the correct application of the dialectical method and his, quote, heavy emphasis on the political independence of the working class, end quote. In response to Slaughter's claim that the Workers' League was showing reservations about the anti-imperialist content of the colonial revolutions and about the unity of the proletarian revolution in the advanced capitalist countries and the colonial national liberation movements, David North pointed out that in fact, quote, all colonial national movements are a unity of antagonistic class forces. And he said, the pressure of imperialism does not mitigate, but rather intensifies the class struggle within the semi-colonial countries. He continued, again, in contradistinction to the Pabloites and the Stalinists, we hold that the anti-imperialism of the colonial bourgeoisie is of a relative and not an absolute character, conditioned by the level of development of class contradictions within each of the oppressed nations. The objective anti-imperialist content of the colonial revolution and its historical unity with the proletarian struggles in the metropolitan centers must be strengthened and actualized through a consistent struggle against the bourgeois nationalist leaderships of the mass movements within the oppressed countries." End quote. This profoundly dialectical understanding of the anti-colonial movement 
is a central component of the theory of permanent revolution. At this point, uh, I think it should be emphasized, David North and the leadership of the Workers' League remained confident that a thorough discussion within the IC leadership could clarify the political issues and reorient the WRP. North concluded his letter to Slaughter by again reminding him of the role uh, he had played in the fight against Pabloite revisionism, including his repeated warnings that revisionism reflected the pressure of imperialism on the workers' movement. Amid a deepening crisis of capitalism and of the Soviet regimes, Jack Barnes's open attack on Trotskyism reflected the deepest need of the capitalist class to disrupt and derail the revolutions both in the former colonial countries and the workers' movement in the centres of imperialism. It was therefore essential, North wrote, for the International Committee to remain alert to any traces of the revisionist outlook in its own ranks. Cliff Slaughter's 1983, uh, December 1983 letter is particularly striking because despite criticizing the Workers' League for supposedly neglecting the, quote, daily struggle to develop the dialectical method in cadre training, end quote, the letter exhibits the very same impressionistic and pragmatic method that Slaughter had polemicized against 20 years earlier in the struggle against the reunification of the SWP with the Pabloites. In Opportunism and Empiricism, which has been referenced numerous times in the course of this school, Slaughter had written, quote, with Hansen and the Pabloites, their new reality is actually a list of abstractions, like the colonial revolution, the process of de-Stalinization, irreversible trends, leftward moving forces, mass pressure, etc. Like all statements about social phenomena, these are meaningless unless they are demonstrated to have specific class content for class content and exploitation are the, are the content of all social phenomena, end quote. Drawing the connection between Hansen's empiricist method and the SWP's glorification of the Castro regime in Cuba, Slaughter explained, quote, Marxist analysis of the whole modern epoch has established that the po political leaderships representing non-working class social strata can go only to a certain point in the struggle against imperialism. The objective limits to their revolution lead them eventually to turn against the working class with its independent demands which correspond to the international socialist revolution. Only a course of the construction of independent working class parties aiming at workers' power based on the program of permanent revolution can prevent each national revolution from turning into a new stabilization for world imperialism. As has um, already been stated uh, by other comrades, this and, and other works by Slaughter from the 1960s read as an indictment of the WRP's abandonment of permanent revolution uh, through its promotion of various bourgeois nationalist regimes in the Middle East uh, as the legitimate revolutionary leadership of the masses of that region, um, which will be discussed further in the second part of this lecture by Comrade Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good evening, afternoon and morning, comrades. With no response forthcoming to North's reply to slaughter, just explained by Tom, the Workers' League began a political struggle over the WRP's abandonment of permanent revolution, most directly in respect to its writings on the bourgeois nationalists in the Middle East. The first extended criticism of the WRP's line was taken up by North in a January 1984 letter to Mike Bander, ahead of an IC meeting planned for the next month, addressing the news line's recent championing of PLO leader Yasser Arafat. Now the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, was a bourgeois nationalist organization founded by the Arab League in 1964 to wage an armed struggle against Israel for an Arab state in the territory 
of mandatory Palestine. It was an umbrella group of various factions. And Arafat had co-founded the dominant Fatah faction and become chairman of the PLO's executive committee in 1969. The WRP began developing relations with the PLO in 1976, and really from that point, increasingly passed over from a legitimate defense of the movement against imperialism, critical support, to total adaptation and adulation. North's criticisms in his letter focus on the most recent episode in that process at the time, which was the WRP's glowing account of Arafat's meeting with Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak in December 1983. With this meeting, the WRP had claimed, Arafat's audacious diplomacy has helped to undermine the treaty between Egypt and Israel. The meeting signaled the Egyptian government's recognition of the PLO, its legitimacy in the Middle East struggle, and its inalienable right to fight for the liberation of Palestine, reversing, they claimed, the earlier Camp David conspiracy between Sadat, Begin, and Carter. Now, Anwar Sadat was the third president of Egypt from 1970 to 1981. He oversaw domestically policies of economic privatization, liberalization, and uh, on the world stage, a realignment of Egypt towards the United States. In negotiations following the Yom Kippur War, or the Fourth Arab-Israeli War of 1973, he began a normalization of relations with Israel, becoming the first Arab leader to visit the country officially in November 1977, meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Menahem Begin in Jerusalem. The two then held talks mediated by the United States and President Jimmy Carter at the presidential retreat Camp David in 1978, signing the Camp David Accords after 12 days of secret negotiations. And this set up the 1979 Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty for which Egypt was expelled from the Arab League. Now, these were very fundamental experiences demonstrating the bankruptcy of the Arab bourgeois nationalists. Egypt's accommodation with Israel was part of a broader move to accommodation with imperialism. It helped to set the stage, as North notes in his letter to Banda, for the bloody Israeli invasion of Lebanon and siege of Beirut in June 1982 aimed at driving the PLO out of the country, which it had used as a base of operations. The claims made by the WRP of the Arafat Mubarak meeting suggested that this history and the enormous inter and intra-class processes it contained had been somehow reversed by a diplomatic masterstroke. That claim, which as North notes is more appropriate to the uh, bourgeois idealist historiography of the great deeds of individuals expressed a political drive on the WRP's part to whitewash the Arab regimes and to champion Arafat's attempt to base the Palestinian struggle on maneuvers between them. The meeting with Mubarak was only the latest example of many, all ultimately leading to betrayals of the PLO by the Arab regimes. As North notes in his letter, the stench of Camp David was not buried with Sadat. The Arab bourgeoisie, shattered by the virtual collapse of OPEC and terrified by the specter of socialist revolution, is searching desperately for a formula which will allow them to bury the hatchet with Egypt. Then the stage will be set for an accommodation with Israel itself. He then identifies the essential error, the actual relations between imperialism and its client state, the clients in the Middle East, as well as the changes in class relations within each Arab country are not even referred to. Now, of course, this was working both ways. The false approach encouraged an adaptation to the bourgeois nationalist regimes. But the false approach was itself encouraged by the imperative increasingly to maintain 
the WRP's mercenary relationships with these regimes to the great cost of the Arab working class, and perhaps none more so than the Palestinian working class. In fact, the PLO was increasingly exploited by the WRP as a stepping stone to various deep-pocketed factions of the Arab bourgeoisie, just as these forces made use of the PLO when it suited them to boost their reputations at home. In a superficially contradictory way, this took the form of the WRP's constant glorification of the PLO's every action, with any correct notion of critical support replaced by invocations of the sanctity of the armed struggle and the organization's claimed status as, quote, the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. This was carried out to the point, as North notes in his letter, that the WRP was defending Arafat even against sections of the PLO at least partially critical of his opportunist maneuvers. In other words, the working class was abandoned to the leadership of the bourgeois nationalists with any policy of building the ranks of the Fourth International among the Palestinians or in the Middle East more broadly dispense with. In place of the fight to arm the working class with a Marxist program, to establish its political independence and prepare it to carry out the liberation from imperialism, imperialism and completion of national democratic tasks in the process of a socialist revolution, the WRP put forward the PLO as the leader of the struggle for the emancipation of the whole Arab nation. North writes, by writing articles which serve only to justify what has already been done by Arafat and which paint in bright colors this or that pragmatic maneuver, the danger arises that we are falling victim to a political outlook that calls into question the real necessity to build the Trotskyist movement in the semi-colonial countries and within the anti-imperialist national liberation movements. The only program on which the Trotskyist movement could have been built in the region, and the only basis for defeating imperialism and the national bourgeoisie, was an orientation to the class struggle and a fight on that basis for the unity of workers across the Middle East. North makes a point in his letter of referencing contemporary ongoing struggles uh, not only in Marrakesh, Tunis and Cairo, but also in Haifa, in the north of Israel, evoking the Fourth International's original and correct 1948 statement on the formation of the Israeli state, declaring that total renunciation of Zionism is the sine qua non condition for the merging of Jewish workers' struggles with the social, national and liberation struggles of the Arab toilers. History, unfortunately, had the opportunity to show what the alternative offered. The ongoing slaughter of Palestinians in a vastly unequal conflict, the Oslo Accords, the Palestinian Authority, and the current moves by Israel to raise the West Bank to the level of Gaza, all taking place as the Arab regimes proceed with a normalization of relations with Tel Aviv in service to imperialism's anti-Iranian axis. Now North's letter focuses on the PLO, but is clearly written as an, as an initial critique of the WRP's whole line towards the bourgeois nationalist regimes and liberation movements, as the beginning of a political struggle for a change of course. He calls for a balance sheet of this activity, making an analysis of each concrete experience through which the International Committee has passed as part of an exhaustive discussion on international perspectives aimed at the drafting of a comprehensive international resolution. That is, the Workers' League was pursuing international and not necessarily convivial, but comradely clarification. And it was guided by the conception of the absolute necessity of a world perspective discussed by Comrade Tom in the first half of this lecture. North explains, no matter how promising certain developments within the national work of the sections may appear, 
such as our own experiences in various trade union struggles. These will not produce real gains for the sections involved unless such work is guided by a scientifically worked out international perspective. And the final point for this document, the Workers' League's criticisms are rooted explicitly in key historic experiences of the Trotskyist movement. The SLL struggle against Pavlovism, particularly over the questions of Algeria and Cuba in the 1950s and 60s, and the recent events involving the SWP and Jack Barnes's open repudiation of permanent revolution, as we've just heard. In making this critique, the Workers' League had the benefit of experiences made not just with the PLO, but with Libya, Iraq and Iran, which I will discuss in the context of the next major document of this period, a North February 1984 report to the International Committee, and also with Zimbabwe and Sri Lanka, which I would like to outline briefly at this point. The WRP set out its anti-Trotskyist position on the struggle against British imperialism in Zimbabwe at its fourth Congress in March 1979 in a resolution authored by Banda. The document never referred to the independent class interests of the proletariat, instead speaking in non-class terms of the multi-millioned masses. Workers in Zimbabwe were encouraged to place their trust in the patriotic front of Robert Mugabe and Joshua Nkomo. The Patriotic Front was a coalition of the Zimbabwe African People's Union, led by Nkomo, and the Zimbabwe African National Union, uh, the main faction of which was led by Mugabe. Each had its own military wing, which had been waging a guerrilla campaign against the white minority government of Ian Smith since the late 1960s. Now, again, these were bourgeois nationalist organizations, but Banda assigned them the leadership of the struggle in Zimbabwe under the duplicitous formation. We support the patriotic front of Mugabe and Nkomo insofar as the front continues the armed struggle against Smith and rejects a constitutional compromise. Now, in the same way as with the PLO, the armed struggle was identified as, uh, quoting North in how the WRP betrayed Trotskyism, the supra class strategy of anti-imperialist struggle, rather than a tactic employed by definite social forces in pursuit of their class interests. The WRP acted to cover up the fundamentally opposed interests of the bourgeois nationalists and the Zimbabwean working class in peasantry. As for the insofar as condition for the WRP's support, well, this was dropped within a year. In November 1979, the Patriotic Front called off the armed struggle and entered negotiations with the Smith government, the Lancaster House talks, overseen by British imperialism in London. The WRP spent the duration of these talks engaged in a degrading game of catch up, justifying every retreat and sellout authored by Mugabe and Nkomo. Their result was a Zimbabwean parliament with 20 of 100 seats reserved for the white minority, just 5% of the population. Policies of nationalization delayed and with compensation. Acceptance of the capitalist base of the economy with any seizures of private property or blanket nationalizations forsworn. And peaceable relations with imperialism. Within three years, President Mugabe had slaughtered 20,000 civilians in Nkomo's home region, presumed supporters of his faction, and forced him to flee the country. As Tom has already indicated, I'd like to go into further, the WRP's glorification of the armed struggle had its most disruptive impact within the ICFI in Sri Lanka, where its swing behind the liberation tigers of Tamil Ilam from 1979, severely handicapped 
the RCL's political work in opposing Tamil nationalism and Sinhala chauvinism and fighting for the unity of the Sri Lankan working class. The LTTE was founded in 1976 to fight for an independent Tamil state, carrying out attacks on government targets and officially from 1983, fighting a bloody civil war with the Sri Lankan government. The WRP uncritically embraced the LTTE as it had the PLO, establishing relations with the organization and even publishing the work of one of its pamphleteers, Anton Balasingham, demanding that the RCL do the same. The work in question on the Tamil national question argued that socialists must uncritically support the separatist ambitions of the Tamil bourgeoisie. The reactionary character of this policy was made very clear in 1980 when an, LT when an LTTE polemic declared, Tamil people have had enough of the rotten ideology of the unity of the working class and an all Sri Lankan revolution. The RCL was thus heavily restricted in its ability to politically challenge the Tamil nationalists and to clarify the issues involved in what was an escalating conflict with tragic consequences for the Sri Lankan working class. Ultimately, the civil war in Sri Lanka cost the lives of tens of thousands of combatants and over 100,000 civilians, serving only to harden division, strengthen the state and the forces of political reaction. Even prior to its support for the LTTE, the WRP had not approached the political problems in the region in line with the theory of permanent revolution, again causing serious problems for the development of Trotskyism. In 1971, Tom explained, the Indian government of Indira Gandhi declared war on Pakistan, intervening in the ongoing conflict between Pakistan and Bengali nationalist forces in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. The RCL prepared a powerful statement aimed at unifying the working class of the whole subcontinent, supporting the legitimate struggle in East Pakistan, while insisting that it could only be carried through in a socialist revolution. As a vital part of this perspective, the RCL called for a revolutionary defeatist policy in Pakistan and in India, whose intervention on the side of East Pakistan, Bangladesh, was aimed at setting the terms of its victory and quelling the revolutionary potential of the struggle, including within the borders of India. But the WRP imposed a position of supposed critical support for the Indian government, claiming it was aiding the liberation of Bangladesh. When Comrade Kirti Balasuriya raised his objections in a letter to the IC requesting international discussion on the matter, the WRP prevented its circulation. Now, at this time, it should be noted, the early 70s, the WRP was also opposed to any even critical support for the self-determination of the Tamils in Sri Lanka, the polar opposite of the position it would soon take up. Now, these two positions on the India-Pakistan war and that earlier position on the uh, Tamil question were closely connected. Comrade Balasuriya explained shortly after the split in the essay, The Tamil Struggle and the Treachery of Healy, Banda and Slaughter, in regard to the WRP's early position on the Tamil question in Sri, in Sri Lanka. In Banda's view, any demand to uphold the right of self-determination of minority nations in the newly formed independent states would play into the hands of imperialism for the ostensible reason that such demands would disrupt the tenuous unity forged among various nationalities in the backward countries in the course of the struggle against imperialism. This position implicitly accepted the bourgeois states created in the aftermath of, war of the Second World War as formations representing more or less the democratic aspirations of the masses oppressed by imperialism. Now, for the same reason, Banda supported the actions of the Indian bourgeoisie against Pakistan aimed primarily at securing the integrity of the Indian state. 
by the time of the switch uh, to support for the LTTE with the previous policy left totally unexamined, the WRP was all the more driven to search for shortcuts uh, and all the less concerned with theoretical consistency. Needless to say, the political standing of Trotskyism was damaged and would have been far more so if not for the principled struggle of the party in Sri Lanka led by Conrad Balasaria. Uh, damaged by these gyrations and contradictions in policy, which as the next section of this lecture will demonstrate, were if anything all the more glaring in the Middle East. The relations entered into by the WRP with Middle Eastern bourgeois nationalist regimes are taken up in Comrade North's report to the February 1984 meeting of the IC, which will be the focus of the remainder of this lecture. An alliance, unbeknownst to the IC, was signed between the WRP and Muammar Gaddafi's uh, Libyan Jamahiriya, roughly translated as People's Republic, in July 1977. Shortly afterwards, relations were developed with Saddam Hussein's uh, Arab Ba'athist Socialist Party in Iraq. And not long after the Iranian Revolution of February 1979, a hand was also extended to the Khomeini regime. Beginning briefly with Libya, Gaddafi came to power as the leader of a young officer's coup in 1969 against the puppet regime of British and US imperialism led by King Idris I. In power, Gaddafi enacted a program of nationalizations and social reforms coupled with repression while maintaining the bourgeois capitalist character of the state and the economy. He developed a political theory of sorts, published as the Green Book, identifying the Soviet Union as imperialist, praising nationalism as a progressive force and advocating Islamism. All of this was given a glowing write-up by the WRP in its paper, in terms that could only disorient and demoralize a cadre which had dedicated its life to Trotsky's principles. Gaddafi had, the news line claimed, set Libya on the road of socialist development and expansion. The experience of the Libyan revolution had demonstrated that the struggle for world socialist revolution can and will destroy bureaucracy forever, and the WRP stood ready to explain the teachings of the Green Book as part of the anti-imperialist struggle. Gaddafi himself had supposedly, uh, entirely in the manner of the Pavlovites, unconscious Marxists like Castro, spontaneously, quote, develop politically in the direction of revolutionary socialism. Now, turning to Iraq, the Ba'athist tendency of which Hussein was a leader of its Iraqi wing was an Arab nationalist movement, which made use of certain socialistic phrases and ideas founded in the 1940s. Its representatives came to power initially uh, in Syria and in Iraq in 1963. Ba'athism's political successes grew substantially out of the false policy of the Stalinist communist parties throughout this period. By the mid-1970s, both the Iraqi Communist Party and the Communist Party of Syria were uh, signed up to so-called national progressive fronts with the Ba'athists recognizing their right to leadership. Hussein came to power uh, formally in 1979. In reality, it assumed leadership uh, some years earlier. And he rewarded the Iraqi Communist Party with a campaign of savage repression, including the execution of many of its members. The WRP's uncritical embrace of this regime was such that they defended these executions, taking what North described in his report as a position with no precedent within the Trotskyist movement. The newsline had written, this is a straight up case of Moscow trying to set up cells in the Iraqi armed forces for the purposes of undermining the regime. It must accept the consequences. It is a principle with Trotskyists that we defend workers, whether they are Stalinists, revisionists, or social democrats, 
from the attacks of the capitalist state. But as the facts show, that has nothing to do with the incidents in Iraq. Now this frankly uh, grotesque statement demonstrates the degree to which the WRP at this point held up the bourgeois nationalist regimes as sacrosanct, as an arena from which even formal acknowledgement of the necessity of a revolution establishing the dictatorship of the proletariat was excluded. In fact, in a document presented at its fourth congress in 1979, the WRP wrote that the strategy of Anglo-US imperialism in the Middle East was dictated solely by its desire to protect the oil fields from expropriation by a radical regime, relegating the working class to, at best, an entirely secondary role. A year later, the WRP was describing the Ba'athists as, in the long run, the real threat to the intrigues of imperialism and Stalinism in the Middle East. Basing its perspective for the Middle East on the actions of the bourgeois nationalist regimes, the WRP was deeply compromised with the outbreak of the Iran-Iraq war in September 1980, in which uh, Hussein had hoped to take advantage of an Iran he assumed would be weakened by the revolution a year earlier and seize territory. That war uh, continued to 1988, was devastating for both sides, uh, costing well over half a million lives and well over a trillion dollars. After three months of progress, uh, Iraqi military forces were halted. Iran then invaded Iraq in 1982 and an extremely bloody stalemate developed from 1983. The Iraqi invasion was deeply reactionary, carried out with the support of US imperialism and part of a prolonged swing to the right by the Iraqi regime, including a closer alignment with the imperialist powers. The WRP correctly opposed it formally, but it felt compelled by its previous positions to muddy the issues, refusing to denounce Iraq for acting on behalf of imperialism. In fact, as North noted in his report, a WRP political committee statement absurdly declared, we call for full support for the national revolutionary movements, including the Arab Ba'ath Socialist Party, and the Iranian revolution in their fight against imperialism. A few months into the conflict, the WRP declared for good measure, our opposition to the war does not diminish our support for the Arab Ba'ath Socialist Party in Iraq, insofar as it continues to uphold its struggle against imperialism and Zionism and support the Palestinian revolution. The invasion was treated essentially as an aberration from an otherwise progressive record and future of Ba'athism. Rather than seek to mobilize the working class against it, the WRP appealed to Hussein to stop and suggested a peace conference of Iran, Iraq and the PLO for a deal to be worked out entirely behind the backs of the working class. Iran's counter invasion, having defeated Iraq's aggression, was likewise a reactionary act driven by its own expansionist aims. But by September 1983, the WRP had turned 180 degrees and declared for the military victory of Iran. By this point, the WRP was so beholden to the bourgeois nationalists that it was essentially caught in the slipstream of whichever regime seemed to be on the up. North summarizes in his report the effect, we are disorienting our cadre and the working class. We are inviting cynicism toward our political line. A continuous shifts in our political line in which no analysis connects a new conclusion with the one it both replaces and contradicts are the hallmark of pragmatism. Now that pragmatism, North's report establishes, was based on a method of the most abject impressionism, glaringly highlighted in the on-the-spot report of the Iranian revolution or its aftermath, penned by Sabas Michael in February-March 1983. 
Again, for context, the Iranian revolution mobilized millions on fundamentally class questions against the brutal US-backed dictatorship of the Shah. Lacking a revolutionary leadership, however, and misled by the Stalinists, the working class allowed power to fall into the hands of the bourgeois clerical forces led by Rahullah Khomeini, who then carried out fierce repression, including thousands of executions, arrests, and the use of torture against all vaguely left-wing forces. In its initial February 1979 statement on the revolution, the IC had correctly warned, in a statement actually published in the Newsline, how in the absence of an organized revolutionary leadership and because of the cowardly class collaborationist policies of Iranian Stalinism, the religious leaders under Khomeini had been able to dominate and were defending the interests of, quote, the bizarre merchants and other elements of the Iranian native capitalist class and petty bourgeoisie. But this analysis was very rapidly abandoned by the WRP, to the point where Savas could write of his visit and have published, one fact is striking, nowhere can one see a policeman. If we consider the degree of popular support as a basic criterion for estimating the degree of political stability of a regime, then undoubtedly, the Islamic regime in Tehran must be considered as extremely stable. Its foundation is the masses, between the masses and their leadership, especially Imam Khomeini, there are mighty bonds forged in the furnace of the revolution. Now, this was observed, and Savas actually made a television appearance, during a time of mass arrests and repression. As North criticized in his IC report, we have here an outstanding example of the complete and unabashed substitution of impressionism for Marxism. Class forces no longer exist. Everything has become the masses, a category which explains nothing about the class dynamics and contradictions within Iran. Analysis is reduced to casual observation. And much the same impressionist method dominated in respect to the WRP's relations with Libya and Iraq. Both countries had experienced quite enormous leaps in fortune in the post-war period. Average income per capita was lifted from among the lowest in the world to the highest in the region and even rivaling some of the poorer European countries. And this took place at breakneck speed, particularly in the 1960s and the 1970s. And as we touched on, some of that wealth made its way into reforms. Life expectancy increased, the range of social welfare indices likewise. And this was coupled, again, as we've seen, with a fair amount of socialistic rhetoric. These developments undoubtedly had their influence on the WRP leadership. Interpreted in a purely empiricist way, they contributed to a political line which increasingly assumed and suggested that a path was open to sustain social progress and even a socialist society, which did not pass through the establishment by a socialist revolution led by a Bolshevik type party of the dictatorship of the proletariat. In fact, what was taking place in Libya and Iraq was dependent on particular and politically unsustainable conditions, which a historical materialist method could clearly disclose. In large part, the source of the increased wealth was oil revenues. And just to give a sense, the uh, Iraq's oil export revenues increased from a billion dollars in 1972 to $26 billion uh, just eight years later in 1980. However, the ability of these governments to claim a significant share of those revenues depended on particular and transitory historical conditions. The existence of the Soviet Union allowing such states to balance relatively profitably between it and world imperialism and also depended on a period, relative, period of relative weakness in the imperialist camp, racked by crisis and the class struggle. Relatedly, the ability of the population to claim a significant share of the new wealth or degree in the form of reforms was rooted in its own mighty struggles 
which had toppled the old regimes and which the bourgeois nationalist leaders lived in fear of, but which had not conquered the ownership of production and therefore stood to be reversed. In other words, just as the world perspective of permanent revolution insists, the gains were not sustainable outside of the progress of the world socialist revolution. With that forestalled, the imperialist camp was able to use the crisis in oil markets caused by the Iraq Iran war to heavily undermine OPEC producers' market share. And of course, the effects of the war itself devastated the Iraqi economy. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, any insulation from the pressures of imperialism was removed, as was brutally demonstrated by the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and the NATO intervention in Libya. Ignoring these historical factors and their relation to the class struggle, the WRP was proceeding in precisely the same way as the Pavlovites, those who, quoting North's report, substitute their superficial impressions for a scientific study of class relations based on the dialectical materialist method and historical materialism, and for whom the need for a revision of Trotskyism and an abandonment of principal positions in line with the reality of living events becomes all-consuming, driving an uncritical adaptation to the illusory stability of, cap of imperialism and those political forces who temporarily predominate within the workers' movement and the national liberation struggles. This was very graphically proved by Savas's Iran report, which had an uncanny resemblance to the report of American SWP member, Mary Alice Waters, returning from Nicaragua in 1980, where the Sandinistas had just taken power. Approaching political events in this way, the WRP was inevitably caught in politically devastating contradictions and swings in policy. Rather than an integrated world perspective, it increasingly based its program on a series of pragmatic alliances with nationalist tendencies organically incapable of resisting imperialism in the long term, of overcoming their own conflicts of interests, and of formulating any viable program for the unity of the working class. Hence North's call in his letter to Banda and in his report for a balance sheet of the IC's experience in relation to the national liberation movement, with the emphasis that the task is to work for the development of the IC as the world party of socialist revolution. Such an exercise, properly conducted, would expose and preclude the sorts of the many mutually conflicting positions taken up in succession by the WRP. Of course, these positions were not purely a case of methodological error, but bound up with political pressures and the cumulative impact of having failed to cognize and combat these pressures and pursued an opportunist line over a prolonged period. An impressionist method was frequently being employed precisely in order to furnish results predecided by the needs of the WRP's opportunist and increasingly financial relations, which themselves had their roots in a false conception that the Revolutionary Party would somehow be built as an extension of a strong national organisation in the UK. North and the Workers' League recognised these pressures and conceived of their criticisms as a continuation of the struggle in the Trotskyist movement against Pavlovite revisionism. North explained in his report, the International Committee is based upon the traditions and principles established through the political, theoretical and organisational struggles of all previous generations of Marxists. And the way in which this continuity of the IC with these previous generations has been developed is through the struggle against every variety of anti-Marxism that has emerged within the workers' movement, especially within the Trotskyist movement itself. The class pressures acting on the WRP were expressed at home as well as internationally, where the party was orienting ever more openly to centrist and middle-class radical elements, above all to the left flank of the Labour and trade union bureaucracy. 
This was expressed in an ultra-left refusal to place demands on the Labour Party in which the working class still had substantial illusions, which in essence which served to absolve the WRP of its responsibility to engage in a struggle with the Labourites, which would have cut across its developing relations with figures like Ken Livingston uh, and Ted Knight and various union bureaucrats. At the core of this response, both to the class struggle in Britain and the abandonment of permanent revolution, as the centerpiece of the strategy of world socialist revolution, was a deep pessimism in, growing pessimism in, and impatience with the working class, driving a search for shortcuts, and a related nationalist outlook, interpreting successes from the standpoint of apparent advances made in particular countries, rather than from the standpoint of the development of an international socialist party and revolutionary struggle. Reversing this tendency could only be uh, done based on a thorough reassimilation of the struggle led by the SLL against the SWP's reunification with the Pavlovites, which as North explained, brought to the fore all the fundamental issues involved in the struggle against Pavlovism. The rejection of the revolutionary role of the working class as the grave digger of capitalism and the builder of a socialist society, the rejection of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the denial of the struggle against spontaneity and the necessity for a conscious struggle for Marxist theory, the renunciation of the historical role of the Fourth International. The contemporary line of the WRP had to be critically evaluated in the light of these issues and the lessons of that struggle. North concludes his report with a proposal for a serious discussion within the IC, a circulation of documents, and the preparation of a full IC conference. By that time, however, uh, the rot was very deep. In a call between us to help prepare this lecture, Comrade Dave told Tom and me that the uh, hysteria in that meeting, which had been rigged by Healy, Slaughter and Banda, while he was making his contribution was such that he never got the chance to finish it. It was confirmed that matters had gone beyond a discussion, a principal political struggle would have to be waged. Recognizing that this is what they confronted, the leaders of the WRP sought to land a preemptive and disorienting blow against the Workers' League by posing ultimatums, threatening to split if the criticisms were not withdrawn keeping focused on the main task to be accomplished, which was to clarify and win to a Trotskyist line as broad a section of the cadre of the ICFI as possible, the Workers' League tactically withdrew their criticisms, pending better circumstances in which the critique of the WRP's political line could be brought forward. That, however, begins to trespass on the theme of the next lecture.